Hello, and welcome to Simple Man Sermons, the preachings of a simple man called by God to share the good news of Jesus Christ. I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this age? Has God not made foolish the wisdom of this world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through wisdom did not know God, it pleased God through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. For the Jews request a sign, and the Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ Christ. Crucified, to the Jews a stumbling block, and to Greeks foolishness, but to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God, because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. For you see your calling, brethren, that not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise, and God has chosen the weak things of the world to shame the things which are mighty. And the base things of the world and the things which are despised God has chosen, and the things which are not, to bring to nothing the things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. But of him you are in Christ Jesus, who became for us wisdom from God, and righteousness, and sanctification, and redemption, that as it is written, He who glories, let him glory in the Lord. And I, brethren, when I came to you, did not come with excellence of speech or of wisdom, declaring to you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. That's a reading from 1 Corinthians, starting in chapter 1 and ending in chapter 2. And obviously it's scripture, it's all good, but I want to hit on some key points here. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? And also, but to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. Let me point something out. Who were Jesus' disciples? Well, they had varied backgrounds, and I think there's something to that. Obviously, Jesus Christ chose his disciples. He says as much. He chose them. More than any other profession, they were fishermen who became fishers of men. But they were fishermen. Now, I don't often mention this if I mention a bio at all because it's not about me. But I grew up commercial fishing. My father was a commercial fisherman. His father before him. It's a good, hearty, salt-of-the-earth, blue-collar profession. These were not super-educated men, right? When Jesus was born, who did the angel appear to? To shepherds. Salt-of-the-earth, blue-collar, working men. You don't need to live in an ivory tower. You don't need an Ivy League education to glean from Scripture to know God. In fact, we don't learn much, if anything, about the disciples' education. In fact, except for Paul, we know very little about any of their educations. Don't disqualify yourself from something God has given to you. A gift, by very definition, is unearned, unmerited. 
undeserved if it were given because of your goodness, your wisdom, your labor, then it wouldn't be a gift, it would be wages. The gift of the gospel is for every man. It's not for the ivory tower elites or the uber wealthy to hold the key. In fact, Jesus himself says, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. And what it says here about the wise, For you see your calling, brethren, that not many wise according to the flesh. What does that mean if not not many highly educated, not many mighty, not many noble are called? You don't need a noble birth to be a Christian. You don't need to be born into it and praise God for that. It matters not that your father had a theology degree. It matters not if you have a theology degree. Like it says here, not many wise according to the world are called. For according to the wisdom of the world, the message of the cross is foolishness. And that was true then and it's true now. Look at today's garbage pseudo-religions like evolution, that you came from a monkey. To the world, that's wise. That makes sense. You somehow came from a single-celled organism that somehow clumped together with some other organisms. And forget explaining how life even started in the first place. They have no idea, but they, they pretend like they do. And then that became some kind of fish creature that decided one day, you know what, that land looks pretty cool. Let me walk up on that stuff. And through time and chance and random happenstance, with God having nothing to do with it, Evolved into some kind of early mammal, which became a monkey, which became an ape, which became you. And that's basically all you are is pond scum. That's the wisdom of the world. Who pretend to know that they know more than God. When God, the wisdom of God says to those who are called, You were made in the image of God. You're not a mistake. You're not random happenstance. You were made in the image. You bear the image of God. You are special. You are of more value than many sparrows. How much more value are you than a sheep? The wisdom of God, if you can hear it, is that you were made for a purpose. You are not a mistake. Whatever time you were born in, whatever gender you are, whatever location you were put in, that is not a mistake. He knit you together in your mother's womb. Before the world began, he knew about you. You are not a random mistake. You are made in the image of God for a purpose. And he loves you. That's the wisdom of God. That's foolishness of this world. That's, that's just one of many mighty revelations to the called, to the chosen of God. That's wiser than the wisdom of this world. The foolishness of God is wiser than any of the wisdom of this world. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. If you seek God, you will be wiser than the wisest mathematician, than the wisest of men, if you understand God more than they do. Because God is the author, arbitrator, maintainer of all that is, all that ever has been, all that ever will be, all that is now. He is the beginning and the end. If you understand some of him, that's wiser than the wisdom of this world. To those who are perishing, it's foolishness. But to those who are called, it is the wisdom of God and the power of God. Notice, of God. It's of God, not of you. This is from Second Corinthians. Not that we are sufficient in ourselves to think of anything as being from ourselves, but our sufficiency is from God. So look at it in the right light. You are special. All the glory goes to God. It is God who is great. Any power that you have is a gift from God. So let us be careful, lest we become prideful. We are God did not choose you because you were strong. He chose you when you were weak and makes you strong. He did not choose you because you were wise. He chose you because he saw you stumbling in the dark and he wanted to bless you 
with wisdom. He does not choose to fill you with good things. He does not choose to feed you because you deserve food, but because he loves you and wants to nourish you. He did not set you free from sin, from the ruler of this world, because you deserved it, because you were so good. No, because you were wretched and unable to do it on your own. Because you could not make atonement for yourself. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. For he became sin who knew no sin that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Not because you were good, but because he is good. Because you deserved salvation, but because he chose in his divine loving nature to pay a debt that you could never pay. You were too poor to pay it. He was the one that held all the wealth. And he chose to pay your debt. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor. That you, through his poverty, might become rich. That's 2 Corinthians chapter 8. You didn't buy your way out of hell. You didn't earn your way out of hell. You didn't earn your way to salvation. You were utterly helpless in that. He paid your debt. A debt you could never ever pay. Not because you were good. Because he is good. Not because you were strong. What does the Bible say? One of the most beautiful verses to me. All of it's beautiful. But I personally I have some verses that I really identify with. While I was yet without strength. In due time. Christ died for the ungodly. You talk about a theological bomb going off in your head. At least it hits me like a ton of bricks. While I was yet without strength. Not because of anything I did. Not because I'm strong. Not because I'm mighty. While I was yet without strength. In due time. Christ died. For me because I was good. Because I was trying really really hard. Because I was almost there. No. While I was yet without strength. In due time, Christ died for the ungodly. It is also written like this. While I was still a sinner, Christ died for me. And talk about the wisdom of God. If you realize this, you're wiser than so many. Not because, again, you were wise, because God chose to reveal it to you. The whole world is stumbling around blind apart from God, apart from Christ. You ever see a kid like pushing something really heavy and they think they're pushing it and then you actually realize because you're watching from a distance that the parents are pushing the thing and the kid just trying really hard like he's pushing the shopping cart but actually the parents are pushing it. Like a little kid struggling with the door really trying to push it open and they think they're doing it and the dad walks up behind him with very little effort with the one hand and shoves the door open and the kid thinks like oh I did it. That, that's the rest of the world. Going around thinking they're making all these great things happen. When really nothing happens apart from God. God makes it all happen. Or how about this illustration. It's like my dog who gets up in the morning, looks at his bowl and it's empty. And he's like, I really, really want food. And I let him outside and he runs around and he comes back in. And the food bowl is full. Because I filled it. But he thinks, oh I ran around the thing and the food bowl got filled. I'm such a good dog. I made food. Right, but because we're much wiser than a dog, we understand that he didn't actually make the food go in the bowl. We did that. And if we didn't do that, he wouldn't have food. It's not his fault. He's a dog. It's how much wiser we are. And I love my dog. He's a smart dog. But he's still a dog. How much wiser we are than a dog. How much wiser, men, is God than us? That's us running around thinking we're making all this stuff happen when really God is doing it. And we think, oh, look what I did, look what I did. That's the wisdom of the world. It's foolishness to God. Hopefully we're wiser than that. And we recognize that God is giving us these good things. Every good and perfect gift is from above. Just the little kids toddling around. 
without strength, without sense, that God is making things happen. So don't be prideful. If you understand that, again, that's foolishness to the world who's full of hubris and pride thinking they're doing all this stuff. But realize that without God, you can do nothing. From John chapter 15. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If that doesn't strip you of your pride, right? But the world won't see that. But if you can, again, the wisdom of God. The foolishness of God is wiser than men. Going around thinking they're doing all these great things. But without God, you can do nothing. You could not draw another single breath if God did not allow it to be so. Your heart would not beat one more time if it wasn't by God's leave. I was in the Marine Corps, and one of the sayings we had a, a naval tradition, as the Marines are rich in naval tradition, is when you'd pass somebody, you would say, by your leave, especially when you pass somebody of greater authority than you. They buy your leave, sir. What that meant was, if you allow it, I will pass by your leave. It is only by God's leave, by His grace, that He allows us to move and do anything. You would not exist apart from God. Which many in the secular world would even deny that. And many more, sadly, are, even if they may concede that there is a God, they think of him as some kind of deist, like some kind of clockmaker that winds it up and steps back. But you should know better, man of God. Because it is written, even the hairs of your head are all numbered. He's not a God afar off. He's a God who is near. He knows all thoughts and intents of the heart. You couldn't do anything apart from him. Your heart would not beat one more time if he decided that it wouldn't. You would not exist in the first place if God did not create you. And if that is not humbling. And again, from John 15. Apart from me, you can do nothing. And this sermon, this this uh, simple man sermon, it's not about me, it's about God. But he chose me, hopefully to illustrate, I can use my life to illustrate some points to you. If you had bet on a kid growing up, it probably would not have been me. When I say I was poor, I'm not just paying lip service. I mean, like, I was poor, even by poor southern standards. Like, eating donated food, getting donated toys. Sometimes sleeping on the floor. Without things like a telephone or air conditioning. Which, to be fair, are luxury items. Most of the other people around had those. Just to illustrate, poor, the bastard son of an unwed teenage mother who worked hard to help and to, and to take care of us, not putting my mother down. I love my mother. But again, if you were betting on a kid, you wouldn't have bet on me. I was not particularly big or healthy or smart by worldly standards as far as what government education would say I was not particularly a good child if I'm being honest as far as morals go because I didn't grow up a Christian I didn't grow up obviously God's law is written on our hearts but I was not particularly a good kid probably not a kid if you were by the world standard rich and wise and well off in my neighborhood not a kid that other parents would want their kids hanging out with if I'm being honest why do I say all that not that we are sufficient in ourselves to think anything of ourselves our sufficiency is from God without God I can do nothing by God's grace many many people around the world will listen to this sermon today and I'm not foolish enough to think that it's because of me. It's not because I'm wealthy. It's not because I grew up with a silver spoon. It's not because I have a college education. It's not because I'm the biggest, baddest dude on the block. 
it is because of God's sovereign, divine love for me that I can do anything. And I'm wise enough to know that. And that's more wisdom than, sadly, many people have in this world. They think the things that they have and do is because of them, because they're so cool, because of they're so good, because they're so wealthy, they're so good with money, because they have so much higher education. And I'm not going to name any names particularly, but sadly, I, as you might imagine, I look at and consume some, some what I would call Christian content, and I see it, and I go, that's not correct. That's not what the Bible says. Again, it's not because I have a master's degree in theology. In fact, I think that would probably make it worse. Because don't rely on what the world says about the Bible or what some university says about God's Word. What does God's Word actually say? And if you know what God's what God himself actually says, that's way, way more real, more true, more wise than anything somebody else is going to tell you that God says. And there is a time to go to other people for interpretations if you're struggling, if you're wrestling with something. What do these other great theologians of the past say about this thing? But you had better know enough to realize if they say something that is incorrect, and not that they perfectly understand God, but you get the point. You don't need a master's degree in theology. Again, the twelve disciples. The majority, if not all, were fairly uneducated. We know Luke was a physician, but that's not a physician like today. Like, I doubt he went to Harvard Medical School or any formal medical school. Doctors were different than we think of them today. And again, most of them were salt of the earth, blue collar, working men. Jesus chose them. It's not about you, it's about Him. So if God gives you something, don't disqualify yourself for something that He died to give you. It's not about you, it's about Him. Satan will try to distract you, the world will try to distract you with all these other things. Oh, but this, oh, but that, oh, but... But what is that to God? God Can, can God do all things? Has His arm been shortened? Has He grown weak or weary? God can do all things. Nothing is impossible with God, and nothing is impossible in Christ. It's not about you. If you could disqualify yourself, look at many of the mighty men of the Bible and tell me they wouldn't be disqualified. David killed one of his friends, one of his devoted followers, and slept with his wife. Or actually slept with his wife and then killed him. God still loved him. Gideon was hiding from the enemy when God called him to be brave. Paul, Saul, the apostle, many of his words we read today, God's words that he, those are from Paul. Paul, in his theological education of the day, was persecuting followers of Jesus, hunting them down until the road to Damascus. When Jesus literally, like verbally and visually, came to him and intervened. It wasn't because Saul was so good, right? He was literally doing the opposite thing that he should be doing. It wasn't because of him. It was because of Christ. He thought he was wise, and then he got schooled by getting told he was doing the completely wrong thing. And he repented and followed God. Not because he was doing good, because God chose to save him. So again, it's not about you. Don't disqualify yourself. You don't need a bunch of money. You don't need a bunch of education. You don't need a bunch of whatever. You just need God. Is it not written, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me? If you are weak, God gives strength. If you are foolish, God gives wisdom. If you are in want, God satisfies every living creature. If you are mired down in the filth of sin, it's Christ who makes you free. 
whom the sun sets free is free indeed. Much of the world is mired down in the quicksand that is sin and sinking and dying. And they know something's wrong and they keep flailing around trying to fix it on their own. It's the wisdom of the world, but... If God is calling you, reaching out with a mighty arm and an outstretched hand, take it. It's the wisdom that's foolishness to the world. Take it. You can't do it on your own. It's not about you. It's about Him. He's stronger than you. Let Him pull you free from that pit of sin. Not on your strength. On His strength. Not because you deserve it, but because He decides to rescue you. It's not about you. It's about Him. Apart from Him, we can do nothing. That's, the wis that's part of the wisdom that we so richly get to be a part of because of His divine grace. Not that we are sufficient in ourselves to think anything as being from ourselves, but our sufficiency is from God. If you need strength, seek God. If you need wisdom, seek God. If you need health, seek God. If you need resources, seek God. He holds all the cards. Whatever you're wrestling with, if you need to be set free from sin, seek God. If you are searching for a deeper meaning in life, if the things of this world just aren't satisfying you, if they just don't make sense, if you haven't come to Christ yet, if you seek, if you yearn for a deeper meaning in life, seek God. If you found God and then wandered off the path like a lost sheep, then go back to the shepherd. Go to God. Wherever you are, whoever you are, in whatever season of life you are in, it is always the right answer to go to God. His arm has not been shortened. He has not lost his strength. He knows. And he loves you. Go to God. That's the wisdom of God. You need him. And he loves you. He loves you because he is good. It's not about you. It's about him. You need him and he loves you. That's the wisdom of God. That's the love of God. That's the life and death and resurrection of Christ. God is love. Thanks for listening and have a blessed day.